Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Town Council Workshop of June 12, 2023. I will start with roll call. Councillor Meany. Present. Councillor McGuire. Present. Councillor Chapel. Present. And I am Councillor Carter. And to the right, I have Town Manager Nate Rudy. We have two items on our agenda this evening, and the first is revisiting the self-storage ordinance. And I believe we have a memo in our packet, starting on packet page two, <clears throat> which identified the three remaining items we've had, for those who are unaware, we've had many workshops on this. We've had um, first read, we've tabled it, we'd have a second read and tabled that again. So, I mean, a first, a second first read. <laughs> and table that again. And so um, we had three remaining items. We received a tremendous amount of feedback. Um, we incorporated uh, most of the items that we received. I've got a count of seven into the ordinance. We had one that was sticking point, uh, the minimum, minimum set back from the road. And then we also had a couple of items related to um, some language, whether or not it met the standard um, for legal and then a second one where I believe that came out of the planning board review they they wanted to verify they understood the language in one other section so I think the easiest thing to do is to have Doug introduce himself and we will kind of go through each of the three items individually and Wayne well, thank you Doug Webster planning director and I appreciate the, the summary that's great I hope that the Intro memo uh, was clear, and we did get some input. Let's see, I can step through the memo mm -hmm. here. Legal has weighed in with the setback, saying that it's a uh, quite standard uh, practice to have different setbacks applicable for different uses. Uh, regarding the minimum the 80,000 minimum lot size. Okay, that, why don't we um, oh, just I'm take sorry. number one. Sorry. So did anybody have any questions on the response from legal on number one? I think the issue was, um, the question that came up was because we listed the ZBA and the planning board, they were concerned that both were listed. In other words, if, if they wanted to uh, appeal a ruling of the planning board, it would go to the ZBA. Um, but it looks like from the attorney's response um, we're just basically setting another restriction by saying this can't be waived mm -hmm. and therefore the planning board and the ZBA are both listed and that's okay yes yep. any Makes sense to you? well I think the planning boards asked us on multiple occasions to be more exact in, <clears throat> in that way and this is a big enough issue that I have to believe if we, people would ask for waivers all the time um, if we if we weren't clear about what the expectation was so yeah I think it makes sense okay Marty no, I'm not. I have nothing okay yeah and I'm fine with it being in there as well okay. didn't mean to jump the gun sorry that's okay we'll um, just take them one and at a time for just for for what it's worth I, I really try not to recommend language such as this unless it's really warranted but uh, given the, my understanding of the council's uh, intention to preserve the front portion and the prob probability of looking for a reduction on that, I felt it was, was warranted. Make, makes sense. Okay, um, number two, uh, packet page two. Um, that is, so that 80,000 when the language was originally drafted was contemplating both the front portion and the rear portion of the lot as one entity. That was the original concept, is that there would be one site plan that would uh, take, utilize the frontage, and then behind that would be the, the self-storage. Um, in further reconsideration of that, if in the minimum, the current minimum lot size in commercial is 40,000, and so the thing, the, the other piece of that was that we tried to calculate what the minimum area necessary for a self-storage uh, facility would be with a buffer and stormwater and everything, but, but we came to the conclusion that if they choose to build a smaller self-storage facility, then why not? Um, so I don't think that that 80,000 minimum achieves anything. 
it strikes me, that if I'm understanding the council's position correctly, the uh, integrity of that first uh, frontage portion is the driving force, not the size of the self-storage facility. I think you're probably right, Krista. Yeah, I, I would agree. I don't think um, if people want to build a smaller self-storage facility, that's perfectly fine, <laughs> in my opinion. Yeah. Yep. Dan? Yeah, I wouldn't see any reason why we would have to set a minimum for that. Yeah, me either. It's good. Yeah, so okay. we'll strike that. I, I think that the that it's the it's the, the goal of the ordinance is to allow people an opportunity to build self-storage businesses while at the same time helping the community broaden the tax base by taking the most valuable piece of property and allowing it to be used for other purposes. Um, for me, the size of the building on the front lot is more of an issue than the back lot piece because if the front lot isn't utilized to its fullest then you know we don't realize the goal so much of diversifying the tax base and spreading spreading the costs uh, uh, across a bunch of different taxpayers um, the other side of that coin for me though is that we also talk about open space in the village and as the village becomes more dense wanting to have still some open space there so I um, I think that the minimum standard for that front lot could be flexible you know if someone wanted to build a 60,000 foot building on the front lot square foot building on the front lot but they were wanted to build 20,000 feet of hardscaped public space, you know, that might be a, a, a good trade-off. Um, would you see that, though, needing or sh would the contract zone approach be the better option for that, do you think? Well, it would, except the contract, the whole idea behind the contract zone being the exception rather than Rule. Right. So well, is there a way for us to write that into the ordinance so that we don't have to do a contract zone? Yeah, I mean, I agree. We shouldn't be doing contract zones all the time. But I also believe that, especially based on the two that we've done, certain projects are very unique and yes. they have worked well. And I, think and I think you made the point, like with the Avesta housing, that that might have been a little smoother had it been a contract zone. I think so. I, I think that I know it's not the intent of contract zoning, um, but I go back to my analogy of the shovel. You know, somebody invented a shovel, and look at how many different kinds of shovels we have. <laughs> the contract zone does give us an opportunity to create something different than we otherwise could with our current zones and our current ordinances. And though we haven't really taken advantage of it yet, the contract zones for both Stillwater Pines and for um, uh, Cumberland Farms, thank you, you know, I think should be the basis for our changes to the to those ordinances when we, when we can get to that point. Yeah, I think my point is just to remind everyone out there in the development world that we do our very best to make it flexible, but also to try to encourage what we want and need in town um, but there are other avenues out there if there's a unique project that is going to add value to the town then there are ways to to address those two i mean i wish that i tried <laughs> to interest the developer of weeks hill in doing a contract zone with the council to you know to save that project uh, you know that would be roughly $90,000 a year in taxes on, you know, on needed housing, but housing that most likely wouldn't enlarge the school system or put a lot of, um, you know, constraints on other services. Um, you know, that was a real missed opportunity. And, and so I kind of want to, I guess I think in the back of my head, whenever we talk about these things, how do we prevent that? something like that from getting away from us in the future. Yeah, and for 
For your point about open space, that project also included quite a bit of yes. well-designed open space. It was going to connect down here to panels, well, it was, so it would have been a wonderful network in the village. When I'm by myself, I still cry a little bit. Yeah. That we didn't get that. Well, and I think it makes panel footprint and the village gateway property open space that we have there is going to become more important in the villages as this, we increase density. Especially 15, you know, 25 years mm -hmm. from now. Um, so that's a good transition to the third item, I think. <laughs> Which you want to kind of talk a little bit about that? Sure, ha happy to provide some some background. And the the concept was to see if there was any practical, <clears throat> excuse me, viability for some type of a sliding scale. So depending on one or more elements, uh, including you know site characteristics, uh, development constraints. Um, was there any practical ability to, in some, for, given a certain set of circumstances, reduce the 300 feet? And uh, we, I met um, with uh, Councilor McGuire about it and actually we kicked around with OAC a little bit. And um, the upshot is that if you were to do that, what, you know, the, the public water, the public water, at least from my perspective, is not a huge thing because you're not really using water and you don't really have wastewater. Yes, you have storm water. Um, and then the, the question uh, or the, the philosophy, the reasoning that was uh, expressed was what if it's a limited site and you only have 200 feet of usable depth? Well, if the town is really well, to respect it, if the town is serious about trying to preserve that frontage, then if you have limited depth, then that depth should be used for a higher value, more convertible commercial space if the mission is to increase the valuation of the town. Um, so I think for, for those reasons, and there, there was not, I think, a, a Council Chapel was at the, the OAC meeting. I don't think there was a consensus at OAC, but I think there were there were those that said point blank that um, we should be retaining that 300 if we're serious about that, that mission. And I guess the, mm -hmm. the final point is that, um, as we said all the way along, and I feel like I've repeated this, I guess I have, that this is at least my expectation, vision, hope, is that self-storage will be revisited as part of the new town-wide zoning. And, um, we've, we've touched conceptually on allowing, as an example, self-storage in, in the back 40, as the expression goes, if it's buffered and screened, because it's really a benign use, it really Especially is. Especially in transition, yep. Yep. Yeah. So, that, so that's kind of where we landed, and I, I'm trying not to be defensive. I hope I'm not no. coming off mm -hmm. that way, and I, I do the best I can. I understand where those that are opposed to the 300 are coming from. Um, but just as with many policy decisions, um, there's a, there's a, there are some legitimate, I, I think anyway, counter arguments, at least for the time being, until we uh, tackle the, the new zoning and look at, at this with a little in more totality. Yep. Krista, your thoughts? Um, yeah, I thought your, your memo really covered all the, all the concerns and the counterpoints for those concerns well. Um, and I, I was one of the ones trying to look for some flexibility around the 300-foot buffer because I, I recognize that can be difficult for people embarking on this type of development. But I, where I've landed, based on your thorough explanation and just our experience in talking about this, is that I, I, do, I do agree that we need to maintain this setback um, because ultimately it's a way for us to keep road frontage viable for the types of properties we really want to see, especially in the village. And I think you're right in identifying that this is the beginning of this ordinance. We haven't finished our zoning work related to the comprehensive plan, and we can always come back to this to add potential sites um, in other parts and other zones around town. So, yeah. Dan? I'd like to know if someone has a lot that has the depth to meet this ordinance such. Um, if, we're, if we're allowing them, if, we, if we're getting rid of the minimum size for um, a self-storage unit, 
than if someone doesn't have as much property behind that 300 foot level, there's still an opportunity for them to create that. So that, that feels like a plus there. But the other piece is around the, the buffers. So right now the buffer between the two lots is what? Remind me. It's at, it's at 50, and, and that 50. is something I should have touched. That is something that I think we could probably provide some flexibility. I, for. I think that, you know, if you're going to... You, you put in a doctor's office, or even you put in a you put in a, a apartment building. If we have the design standard such that puts a facade that's you know um, that fits into the the architecture of the surroundings, you could have a zero buffer between the front piece of property and the back piece of property. Um, you know, it might look like a long wall um, instead of a fence, but it could be done well, you know, not unlike Mr. Libby's done for his with some plantings and stuff, and give, you know, most of that 50 feet back to the developer for that back lot. Um, in the village or in, in densely zoned places, um, unless you want to do something with like trails or other pathways through, through <coughs> town, um, it feels like a lot of space to put just as a screen. So I've sort of been thinking about that. And then the other part of it is if, if there's someone who wants to develop a self-storage unit but is struggling to come up with a viable project for the front part of that property, what resources are available to, to that person to help them, you know, either get in touch with someone who would be interested in that project or could help them develop that project? Um, you know, it's in their, it's in everybody's best interest to see that piece of property developed, the owner as well as the town. And so it feels like, it, it, you know, it doesn't, doesn't have to be an adversarial relationship that maybe that there's some way that, you know, just thinking out loud here, you know, that we can either introduce them to some resources or to some contacts um, to make it more of a, of a partnership and, and less of a um, us and them kind of a thing. Because it, it really is in everybody's best interest to see that piece of property develop. Great. I don't know what that looks like, but. Well, I mean, I think that when people are looking for space in the town, I'm sure they call the planning department once in a while, or they, real estate they brokers, or a little, you know, Sabaya Lakes Chamber, um, and they inquire. So I think the network's there, Dan. It's just a matter of, you know, dovetailing. yeah, dovetailing it. And quite frankly, with the work we're going to be doing in this second half of our workshop here at LD two zero zero three, it's going to open up density. It's going to change the landscape quite a bit in May. You know, we've already had people here waiting who, who said, I've been waiting to do something and I can't, and now I'm going to be able to. So not necessarily all commercial, but, and we'll talk about the mix of commercial and residential in our second half here. But um, yeah, I agree. I, I think, you know, I came down to we either have a range that is lot specific, which is really complex and hard to do. Or we leave it and we readdress after we get this LD2003 work and the comp plan zoning work done. And I kind of landed there because I agree. I think right now everybody is thinking about where they can build self-storage right now. And that's not going to be the case soon. Um, and there are limited spaces <laughs> available. And when you look at those lots, then you start worrying about trying to make them work. But... Um, and then the other thing is saturation. We've had conversations about the fact that we need a variety of businesses, not just one type of business. And so, um, and I think we do have to take advantage of the limited um, frontage that we do have um, to attract uh, new businesses. I mean, you look at, and I know people have talked about us being a food desert. We really are. But there's some unique things mm. coming in. If you look in New Gloucester, you know, Brickyard Hollow just bought a new brewery. 
they put a maples in there and there's a line out the door every almost every day that parking lot is full and it's a breakfast and lunch place mm -hmm. a really good one two moms kitchen right here in the village so i think there we're we're on the crust of getting a lot of attention um and infrastructure matters and i think people forget that having two businesses on one lot requires less infrastructure for us um, we don't want things spread out i know ld200 is going to hamper that a little bit because we can't afford the roads we have now <laughs> quite frankly and so we can't afford what? the roads we have right yeah. now and the infrastructure so the more concentrated we can put the village uh, the businesses and try to attract them into a, a similar area then that helps us with with that as well I really do like the idea of changing the buffer for flexibility there. I think that's imperative. It's part of the LD200 question, uh, 2003 question we're going to talk about later, especially in the village. I think we have to have flexibility in um, space between and buffers because mm -hmm. every spot's going to be unique and our goal is to try to fill that, those spots in. So we got to be flexible. So I like that. And I, I think eliminating the 80,000 um, square foot really opens this up to makes the 300 more workable. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm all for that. Are you for looking at the buffer? I'm going to loop back. Yeah, I thought that was a good idea. I, I, but I just, I had a clarifying question for Dan. Are you talking about only eliminating the buffer between buildings or also around the sides and back? Uh, just between the two lots. Okay. So the cell storage unit could be Probably not a zero buffer, but it could be close. It could be ten feet again if the facade of that part of the building was mm -hmm. uh, attractive enough, um, and there was some planting there. You could park right up against that. And so for the building in the front, if you think about it, you park right up against that fifty-foot buffer, and then fifty feet further on, you have the self-storage unit. That just doesn't feel like a good use of space. Yeah. 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 Right. Then you've got separation of uses. Um, yeah. yeah. I guess the one qu question I would have is that our intention is to keep parking behind the buildings, and I just want to make sure the any buffer that we eliminate between those two lots would still account for having parking in the back. Yeah. I think it would free it up potentially for that parking. Yeah. Potentially, we only needed a ten foot buffer. Right. You know, it could make it a, a, a lot that maybe isn't viable viable. Speaking of parking behind the buildings, are duplexes in the village ordinance um, had a loophole in it such that that building Our village much design better standards, yeah. yeah. So, but I think now with the, the new parking non restrictions <laughs> in LD 2003, well, that would, didn't affect changed. that. I mean, that no. building could have been closer to the road and the parking. Or the back. Oh, Bennett back. Behind, oh, back. It would have looked nicer. And I think that's, you know, I'd like to see us revisit that ordinance. I think it's on the follow up list. So that we can so. just make that adjustment pretty quickly. Village design standards, parking duplexes. Yeah. Personally, I yeah, think it's a I big think it's change. A really, the, the, the actual duplex itself is a, a real huge improvement, in my opinion. It's Better it's than what, what it was, it and yeah, yeah, exactly. And it looks real nice, but you're right. Then it has the cars parked out front, so it kind of okay. kind of takes away from how nice yeah. the building well, looks. It's just an oversight on our part. Yeah, point. yeah. Can't think of everything. So many moving parts. Yeah. So, are you okay with keeping the 300 foot setback from the road, but looking at the buffer in between the two businesses? Yeah, that's fine. Foot? And then with the with say a, a two acre plot, we could the the owner could build a uh, building with with commercial downstairs and residential upstairs, and have a little like 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 buffer yeah, behind, yeah. like we have over here at the uh, where the Chinese restaurant is. Uh, China. Oh China, yeah. yeah, that's actually going to be in our next discussion. You mean having commercial on the first floor, yeah, residential on the and residential second? Upstairs. Yeah, yeah, we'll be yeah. talking about that in a minute. But okay. you're okay with the buffer yeah. between, uh, sure. say, we're a rest. Uh, doctor's office mm -hmm. and then right behind it was a self storage mm -hmm. so i think one of the things i'd just like to bookmark mm -hmm. for the discussion is the sort of walkability of the space so where we have buffers between lots like this do in the case of the cza for stillwater pines one of the um, 
to-dos that we put on that was maintaining the connectivity to the other mm -hmm. trails that are there yeah. and allowing public access for the new ones that are built. You know, we might want to do the same thing within the, within the confines of the village proper and, and the village because, um, you know, I don't know that we'll necessarily have um, pedestrian zones per se, but we want to make we want to make sure people and bikes can move through the town and not just on the roadway. So I don't know how that would work. But, you know, it could be if someone was willing to, you know. Bonus. Yeah, that's exactly. Actually, that's actually, that's something, some sort you know. Of a bonus for <clears throat> the open space committee started looking at the open space subdivision. And we're talking about that. And, of course, LD2003 is hanging out there. So, but we did look at. Um, some material um, that was from, I think, Pennsylvania. They had um, some really unique approaches um, that were far better. There was so much less road and so much more open space, and it was the same number of units. Um, the houses were closer, the lots were smaller, but they had versions where if a developer wanted, you know, the Taj Mahal houses, that they could still do it. But that was part of it. It's the, the bonus. And when we looked at the bonuses that are currently in there, um, there's some good bonuses in there, but there's also a cap on the bonuses. So if you're willing to do one or two things, it's great. But if you do the third thing, you're over the cap anyway. So why would you do the third thing? And That's so a complicated. The, yeah, it's very complicated. And of course, the density is changing. So now that that is all tied together because that's what the bonuses are for. Um, but you know, connectability, having your trails open to the public, that kind of thing. Can get you more of a bonus. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Yeah, that the density bonus cap has been, at least up until LT 2003, um, the tried and true from the attorneys has been don't exceed the gross density for the zoning district that you're in yeah. because otherwise you're compromising the integrity of your zoning ordinance. You can mess around with deductions, but don't exceed the gross. That's, yeah. Those are the marching orders that have been given. Yeah. So. No, it makes sense, but now it's kind of changed. <laughs> but there could yep. be a, you know, there could be a bonus for someone who is willing to make a hardscaped public area versus just planting lawn. Yeah. If, it, you know, within the confines of, of where it was located and what it was abutting a to. So if you had a lot whereby, you know, someone created a hardscape surface on uh, the east side of your lot and the lot further east was undevelopable and that person wanted to come in and part of their goal was to get that too. That hardscape piece would be on the west side of their lot so that they would join together so that we'd have some ability to direct that and kind of as a jigsaw puzzle put those pieces together over time. It seems to me we'd have to have some sort of a carrot to get people to cooperate with that longer range goal. Well, and the other thing is, is what else drives the developer and it's going to be costs. So, right. you know, tying it into some of your road standards, potentially with sidewalk on one side instead of on both or whatever. There are other ways to award them than just straight density. So that's, uh, if you look at this at Stillwater, that's basically what it was. It was they needed a waiver on the road, and in exchange, we asked for these other things. So. And the density there is uh, is not, um, you know, they're not going to get anywhere close to the fifty unit, the fifty houses cap that we put on the on the project. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think so the like twenty nine or thirty, I think they're at. They're at right now. In phase two, when phase two is done. So keep the 300, look at the buffer between the, the units, um, eliminate the reduce the uh, 80,000 square foot, um, and leave the other language. Okay. So that sounds to me like a first read again. One more time. One more time. So All right. You can coordinate that. All right. Well, and that's the, I mean, to unfortunately, none of the folks who have been following us and have been interested in the changes are here tonight, but um, it's not a smooth process or even sometimes a timely one, but each time we've gone 
to that, I think the ordinance has gotten better. So it has it has value that way. Mm -hmm. I, I find it interesting because the the old adage was that once it got to first read, it was locked in, and people never liked that. And sometimes it felt that way. Yes. But, but this is a perfect example of how it's actually supposed to work. That's why you have a first read. That's why you send it to planning board. That's why you have a second read. Now, hopefully, you're not making too substantive to change so that you don't have to keep going back to first read. But if you do, you do. I mean, that's the process. So. Um, Actually, one thing I would like us to consider when the new council is seated that we we have a public hearing at the beginning of the process, at least as an experiment. It may turn out to not improve things, but I think having a public hearing when we first start the discussion and giving people an opportunity to say up front, these are the things I'd like you to think about or these are the things I'd, I'd like, I hope will come out of that is much better to get at the beginning of the process than even at the first read. Because hopefully when we have the first read, we've, we've had the discussion and the way our process is set up now is we're not really having the discussion with the community until the first read, so we have to go back and, and redo it. Somehow yeah, we need I, to get the, the horse in front of that cart, I think. I think we did receive quite a bit of feedback during our workshop process, but I, I see what you're saying. Well, it, it, that was sort of my thought is, um, I, I don't know if we need to formalize a public hearing, but I, maybe we just need to add a, a time for public comment at our workshops where we yeah. discuss these yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think if you, and, and when, so like when mm -hmm. Doug is, bringing this memo to us for LB2003, it's still very opaque. So it's really hard to ask for the, because that, then you don't want to have it too, too early. Because then if you make decisions afterwards and they haven't had, and you change something or they weren't aware of it, then they feel like you, so it's, it's, it's gonna be an interesting thing. Cause that came up with the Army throat. They were like, well, why did you start off without having stormwater on both sides of the road? Well, you have to start with something so that people can actually look at it and say, okay, this is the direction you're headed in, and that usually spurs the, the feedback. Mm -hmm. So, it, like maybe the second workshop or something, have that public comment when you've got a little meat on the bone, so to speak, and then it's far enough before first read, but it also gives them some idea of where you guys are headed so that they can actually dive in and understand what you're about to change or add or take out. Yeah, I, I, so it's interesting. I, I agree with Krista though. I think that if there was someone here tonight and they wanted to speak on this particular issue, I understand that the workshop is the council's time to work and it's different from a council meeting per se, but I still think the, the more we allow for comment and the sooner we allow for comment, the, the less likely I think we are to have conflict further down the road when people are feeling threatened by the fact that we're on the verge of change making a hard. decision and yeah. they can't change it now. Yeah, change is hard. And I, we've had public comment in workshops before, so yeah. there's no rule against it. No. So, yeah. absolutely. All right, anything else on self-storage? All right, moving on to the big one. <laughs> <laughs> I think this starts on packet page five. But I think there's a lot of information in here, so I think if we jump to packet page 11, you guys don't have to jump there, but you need to jump to 11. That is kind of the list of the questions, yep. so we're gonna use that as kind of the agenda piece as far as how we're gonna tackle this giant memo. <clears throat> Does that make sense to everybody? Yep. Yeah? Okay. And you can, um, so we'll start on packet page 11 underneath your summary of the town council input requested. And it starts with the growth area overlay and we'll just kind of go down each one and you can provide information as needed. Okay. Okay. Sounds great. All right. So yeah, what we tried to do is bring the, uh, provide the background, pose the question for each particular policy guidance uh, matter that we're looking for input on. Um, we tried to pose the question, provide the background, and then bring all the questions together at the end. So the growth area overlay, the question is Oh wait, posed. I'm gonna stop you oh. for just one second. So um, I'm, 
wrote this down and I completely skipped over it. Um, in our Teams training, when we agreed that we're going to move the tracking workbook into Teams, one of the things that we also discussed is when we have our initial discussions, somebody taking notes and formalizing that in a Word document so it, when it gets logged into Teams, it can be uploaded and everybody will have the notes. So who would like to do that? <laughs> I can do it. You're all smiling at me, not knowing I'm about to say you're doing it. <laughs> You'll do it, Dan? Sure. All right. So I just wanted to remind us of that kind of new process developed. And then once the chair is picked at the next meeting, you'll send the finalized version of the notes to the chair and that chair would log it into the teams as a task. Sorry, Dan. Um, Doug, go ahead. <laughs> sure, yep. So the growth area overlay, and so as I am trying to summarize, it's a hard thing to bring all the pieces together for, but so we have basically older zoning lines and we have a newer comprehensive plan. And the uh, assumed goal here with the new zoning is to utilize the future land use plan and the comp plan as the at least rough guidance, maybe fine-tuned at the edges and so forth. Um, and the relevance here, bringing it home to the new state legislation, is that the state legislation has specific requirements um, without home rule authority um, that need to be applied to a growth area. So there's a policy decision on behalf of the town as to what we use as a growth area for the initial purpose of implementing LD2003, and I call it LD03, uh, for both density and affordability. Um, the eight, so there's three different parts to LD03. You've got the ADUs, which is uh, about to become effective later this week. There's the density and there's affordability. For the purposes of density and affordability, uh, there are different requirements for growth areas. So the policy decision is what are we going to use for a growth area? Given that we're heading towards implementing the future land use map and the comp plan, it seems like we should be, at least for me, it seems like we should be utilizing the growth area as defined in the comp plan. And so, and if we're going to follow this track, I think, so for temporary purposes, for the purposes of implementing LD03, particularly the density and affordability, to be a temporary growth area overlay. And that growth area overlay would be the foundation for uh, assumed sort of sub-zoning districts as a part uh, of the new zoning. And so it's not an extra, it, we're not wasting effort, if you will, by, and there may be some fine tunes to that. Um, one of my favorite examples is Collie Hill. If you go up Collie Hill, there may be some large lots back there, but they may not have public water. They may have development constraints, and so we may not be able, as a practical matter, to allow increased density up there because of the practical limitations of the site. And one of the elements that I think is very important that the council has weighed in on and, and agreed with is with the new zoning, let's try to, let's do our level best to incorporate what we know about the properties. Let's not have a big, huge commercial district in the middle of Gray Flats where you can't do it. Um, so my proposal is to develop a fine tuning of the growth area and the future land use, uh, utilizing the comp plan as the base and that initial growth overlay on top of our existing zoning is adopted for the purposes of implementing LD2003 for phase one, and then phase two is to utilize that amoeba, that shape, um, as the uh, totality, and then maybe that gets divided into some separate zoning districts. And so but, um, with that, so the question that's embedded in all that background is does that approach ring true to the council? Does that sound like a good approach? And, and if not, are there any uh, suggestions or um, adjustments to it? Okay. I know um, 
know that's Martin? a mouthful. <clears throat> Did you have any thoughts on that, Mark? No. Okay. Um, yeah, I think the overlay is a good idea. Uh, the only thing I saw on the on the map that you had in here, which is packet page 24, um, I'm assuming the red dotted line is the overlay you were thinking of. Is that right? Village mixed juice gross area. 24. That was showing. That was just highlighting that line. Yes. Yeah. And, the, and there's a. I should have included this. I. I'm waiting to connect up with the town attorney. I have a little, I'm trying to figure out how to handle the wellhead district. Uh, well, so the, I had a couple of things to point out. Was one, the wellhead district obviously should not be in the growth area, so we'll have to figure out how to exactly. fix that. Um, and then um, that Libby Hill Road, most of that property on the other side is the school, so I don't know that it, it's advantageous for us to put the whole road in because a good chunk of that property is school property and it's not going to be developed densely. Okay. It's not going to be developed, it's the school. Okay. Um, and then I know Dan had um, brought up in the past revisiting that residential neighborhood ordinance. So I would just point out that the little tiny Wanda Spruce, that little, that's they're really tiny lots and yep. they're probably all non conforming. <laughs> At this point but maybe they are but so it may not make any sense the lines not that far from there so just may not it may look like we have a larger growth district than we actually do in reality um, but I'm, I'm all for the overlay I think it's a great approach um, and it would probably help us with some of the things we're already hitting where people are coming to us and we're saying well could you do it this way it's gonna be that way in a little bit but it isn't there yet, so this will give us a little more flexibility. Dan, what do you think? Yeah, it's there's so many, as you said earlier, moving parts, Doug. Um, I think the overlay is, is probably the only realistic way of doing it, yeah. given that everything underneath the overlay is subject to change. Mm -hmm. um, I. I struggle a little bit because I think some of the rules, you know, not all the rules are written for this this thing yet. Um, so when you look at the lots that are, that are within this area, you know, to Sandy's point, if you if you get down by Sunset or across in front of Russell there, I'll, Great it, Park, yeah, Great Park, thanks. It would be hard. You'd be hard pressed, I think, to fit another unit. Some of those lots you probably could, mm. but not many of them. Um, so how much property is actually in the overlay zone that can be developed? But would you underneath that, you know, identify that residential stamp, which I thought you guys had a pretty good workshop. It was how many years ago? It was, I don't know, it was a while ago. Yeah, with the neighborhoods, because that's a lot of their concern is their neighborhoods are old and small. And small lots. But you can and that's have part of the new zoning. But yeah, yeah, exactly. So and you can yeah. still have growth in a residential area. Um, it just might you just might want it to still be residential, but perhaps it's multifamily. I mean, like well, yeah, and there's lots, yeah. some lots. Like if you, even in Gray Park, there's most of the lots are pretty, mm -hmm. you know, what I call city lots. Like in Williston, everybody has the same mm -hmm. size city lot, but there's always that one that has the double lot or the triple lot. Mm -hmm. So there's a little more room there. And putting a, but putting a multi, a multi-story, multi-unit building in that development would, could change it pretty significantly. Yeah. It especially, could, especially but when you think about parking. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now we don't have a traffic ordinance, so if you someone built an ADU on Bray Park and we can't require them to have off-road parking, so now they're parking on the street. But even if they're not identified those neighborhoods as being in this growth district, this new law allows them to at least have multiple ADUs and duplexes on their lots. So not if there's not room for it. But no. I think that's the point though. Some yeah. lots in these neighborhoods might have that room. So they regardless would. of what and for everyone watching, regardless of what we do, the state has overridden some of our restrictions. Yep. And great. some yeah. of this is happening whether mm -hmm. whether you like it, we like it or we don't. 
So, but yeah, I think. I guess that's for me part of what's a little confusing is I don't know where the boundary is of yeah. what we can do and what we can't do. But I think it's important, Dan, that it adds more weight to that residential tag. And I'm not even sure. I mean, even if you do the residential tag. Village residential. Zone. Yeah, even if you do that, then you're still, LD2003 is still going to allow them to do certain things. And they're even, right. if we right. say you can't have a two-story building here, you know, there's a height restriction on village residential zones that's different than village center proper. Yeah. But they're still going to be able to add another dwelling or two. Oh, yeah. No, I'm not thinking that one we're going to be able to one prevent them from adding a dwelling. Okay. But I, well, I say that for you, but also for those watching. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Again, yeah. we're, we're being overridden on a lot of yes. things right now. So. Um, I, I agree that the overlay makes the most sense, especially given we're looking ahead to the future of, rather than what we have currently on the books. Um, just in regards to what Sandy was talking about, about the zones with Libby Hill and the wellhead. Um, I, in that particular part of town, up 26, um, I, I think the comp plan steering committee, if I recall, was really just wanting to capture the fact that um, development all along Shaker Road was a possibility, especially given the, Han the Hannaford site that has an open lot, which I understand is past the wellhead. Um, yeah. But part of the wellhead does encompass a large portion of Sh Short Shaker Road that potentially could be developed. So, um, I don't know. We were just talking a minute ago about how we have very limited road frontage. and. Um, well, I think you have to remember that the next zone beyond this growth is transition, and that's still going to allow frontage. Right, but it's not, it's not as walkable to the It's project. absolutely not walkable. Right. So I think that's where we were trying to encapsulate most walkability by drawing this map. Um, I think perhaps a better approach, go, you know, once we get this district defined um, more permanently later on would be to ha perhaps have the like types of development you could have within that wellhead on Shaker Road be very specific so that there's not. Well, the wellhead one and wellhead two are different standards, is that correct? Right, they're pretty, right now. pretty they're similar. close. Mm -hmm. You still have four acres per dwelling unit. Yeah. Which is pretty substantial, of course, all under the intended purpose of, purpose of minimizing the cumulative wastewater flow within yeah. the 200-day uh, travel time. Right. Yeah. So I think we just need to be careful about that. But I think that LD2003 is written that the water quality has to be a yep. factor in development. <laughs> So mm -hmm. there would be a stop gap there. Right. Yeah. So I guess I'm just I would Is that correct? I just I don't want to so. limit I'm working on that. I guess yeah. what I'm what I'm getting at is um, we don't know what that's gonna look like ultimately. Uh, and I don't I don't wanna totally eliminate that section of, of town from this growth area because I think if as we have limitations and we are specific Well had one. One and two. I'm not. I'm not advocating okay. eliminating okay. wellhead two. Just right. wellhead one. But yeah, I, I, I see. Wellhead one is particularly in, in a walkable section of town. So I. I well, that's know. on. Um, that's actually. Most of it's this. Most side. of it's. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. actually. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure how walkable that road is. That's that's that road that um, goes down along yeah, I know the turnpike. Where it is. Yeah, th yeah, right. But there's, but so, part of it's up beyond yeah. before the bridge going out. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think BT T two and BT one. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that whole area is fine. Mm -hmm. I'm just a little concerned about you know. I agree with eliminating Libby Hill. You're right that that's not developable um, as school property. But yeah, that um, section of it isn't. But yeah, and, and you know, that neighborhood's the same problem as Gray Park. So I think if we just identify a village residential neighborhood ordinance or tag where you have mm -hmm. some more height restrictions or other restrict, whatever restrictions we're allowed to have, um, then that might be a better way to approach that. Mm -hmm. But if you, quite frankly, I just don't see how anybody's gonna be able to add much density to any of those properties on that, on those streets. Maybe the ones on, Chris Street, the last street, maybe they're, 
there's more back lots. I mean, sometimes developers buy up two lots. Yeah, and that's what they would have like, to do. You know, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> potentially. Yep. Nate. Doug, can you just tell us all about where the rulemaking landed on municipal government's ability to do performance standards like setbacks in growth areas? No, are we allowed to have a very, very limited? Right. Uh, there was a lot of home rule that was taken away uh, with this, and yeah. and I I think I uh, and, and so as the practical and so the it should have been more clear with the overall. So my I'm looking for some policy guidance from the council on the concept of a growth area, and it's very helpful. Uh, but the intention was to come back with a revised growth area. Will um, that would reflect uh, comments uh, here tonight, as well as what's practically viable. And I, I understand and agree with the, the residential tag. Unfortunately, if the town is going to be uh, timely about getting this on the books, we can put some placeholders in for these residential areas. But, but we've got to have this growth area in place before it's presumably happened concurrently with the implementation of the density and affordability aspects of LDO3. I guess I, the reason I'm asking is to try to clarify the, like, I'm trying to support what you're saying, which is we want to try to figure out what, what should the growth area be in, with respect to the mandate from LD2003. And to use gray, the, um, circle there um, as an example, it might be hard to imagine or envision housing going in there, but under LD 2003, it's permitted. So maybe on some of these larger lots, you can see a 800 square foot ADU being built on the back side of one of the houses or on the side of it and sharing a door yard, you know, the big house, little house type of door yard or parking or something like that and just came up a second ago maybe a developer would buy two of these lots and combine them so that you could fill in the sandwich space in the middle those are the kinds of eventualities that i think you're asking the council to consider in def defining not what's there but what's possible under 2003 that could be coming right but, but i think the the difference is they can do two wherever they have one Regardless. In the growth area, they can do four. Right. And so that's my concern with the wellhead one. Is you, it's not a little more density. It's a lot more density. And, and so I would prefer, you know, given the issues we've had in this area with water, uh, water quality, groundwater testing and that kind of thing. Just cut it out. Just to, you know, for the growth area, we can't, as you're stating, Nate, there's, there's very little we, we can do about the other density bone additions that's happening <clears throat> everywhere regardless but this gives the council or the town the ability to say where's the four and where's the two you know where are we doubling it where are we quadding it mm -hmm. so I just I, I think we have consensus we want an overlay that that's yeah. the route to go yeah I think that's true yeah yeah, yeah. and so sure I think it's you're playing with the lines and coming back to it and and getting the council to say, yeah, this is where it should be. But that's pretty much the reason why we need that overlay the, to identify a growth area is because the rules are different. One is going to allow substantially more density, and the other is more density. Back at page 14, as, as a summary yeah. that came from the attorney. Right. I, I think there's some questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's. Do you mind if I ask another question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Doug, in light of the changes in LD 2003 and also the conversations that we've had around, you know, around the Gray Village Master Plan and sort of seeing, seeing the hub and spoke network of neighborhood centers in and around the Gray Village, you know, like go from pl point to point and sort of see a little spot, a corner or whatever, where maybe you know, some additional, like a, a convenience store or a community center or something like that might pop up in time. Given the changes in LD 2003 since the comprehensive plan, would you recommend that whatever overlay district is developed for this GAO, that the 
ordinances be um, sort of like lined up around that and we'll try to get as close to what the comp plan envisioned as possible but just have to work with LD 2003 and there might be some like like in talking about um, wellhead one cutting that out of that overlay really pretty much means cutting it out of that growth zone also doesn't it it, it does and, and it's not that so if the, there's a policy decision on behalf of ideally what would happen is the town would implement its new zoning and then LD would be rolled together as a practical matter if we're going to try to if the town is going to try to honor the intent and purpose of LD03 we need to get something on the book soon now that growth area could be revisited as an intent as a uh, part of the rezoning but we would like I would I think it's incumbent I think it it's better for everyone if we can be as careful as we can with implementing the overlay 403 and then fine tuning it with the zoning that's where I'm yep that's that's the approach but I think that's but ultimately somewhere down the pike the zoning's probably going to align more with the overlay as a matter of yeah. it will. practicality it will. Yeah. well okay. and, and to your memo once the zoning is done and the ordinances are updated there will be no overlay yeah. just that's be right. the zone so yeah, exactly. the overlay is temporary that's kind of where I'm yeah. Yeah. yes just trying yeah. to clarify that yeah Dan? Uh, I uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in favor, actually, of cutting Wellhead 1 out of both of them. Um, just because Wellhead 1 is under a lot of threat um, at any given point in time anyways. Um, it's, it needs to be moved, but whether that eventually happens or not remains to be seen. But uh, until then, I think we have to protect it. Um, and especially in light of some of the other news we've had recently. Mm. Um, I'm also struggling a little bit with the section of the area that's um, commercial being in this, in this zone too. Um, in that area along. Can you try oh, Lewiston. Transition? No. Or Shaker? It's actually along Route 100. Yeah, Lewiston. Spring Meadows, everybody's Spring Meadows. Lewiston. Mm -hmm. But does that go to a, the future item in his memo about us wanting to have mixed uses, Dan? Is that your concern, to ensure that there's still some commercial there and not just yes, all housing? Yes, my concern, yeah. I mean, we've talked about not allowing residential buildings in commercial zones. So can, but saying can, that this can be part of a growth area, like, undercuts that. Unless they triplicate. wanted to do both. Yeah, you can have residential and commercial businesses side by side, but you're worried it's going to be more like manufacturing type businesses? or No, that it's going to be all residential. I don't think that was the intent of the mixed use. Like, it's not, it's supposed to be but the, commercial I and residential. Can't, I let me ask that, let me ask that question for you, just well, to clarify. Saying. Can we, are we still going to be able to restrict and say that we want commercial and if you're going to do residential residential it has to be mixed is that restriction possible that could be it would, that could be done as an integral as a, accompanying the growth district there could be a change to the commercial district standards okay i just wanted to clarify so, yeah. a, a performance process. standard go ahead dan but I'm concerned that in the meantime that mm -hmm. that land will get eaten up for residential by someone and there's nothing that prevents that from happening if we include this in that in that area so and again that that conceptually similar to that which we just talked about with self-storage accompanying the adoption of the growth area <coughs> There could be a corresponding interconnected, if you will, piece that changes some of the performance standards for uses in commercial districts. So simultaneously. So you can limit residential development in a commercial district. Or you could say maybe the right on 
on cue with self-storage. Maybe residential needs to be set back a little bit. And so you, you can do, do it there, but set you're, back. If you're going to do commercial, yeah. then the I, I understand floor. what he's saying. I guess I'm, I'm, Is, I'm, I'm looking at you to say, does that? No. No, OK. I personally, I don't know why everyone's that I hear from who has concerns about growth in the village is so opposed to residential. That's the point. That's the point is that we have residential growth and we have commercial growth and the commercial residential growth drives the traffic to the commercial growth and I, I don't I don't really I don't see why it so if it is residential and it's dense because it's in the dense city zone I don't see why that's a problem yes yeah, we just I think, disagree on yeah that. well uh, and I, I think well, the balance well, matters right well let me finish I, I I don't agree with that I mean you can have a lot of residents in the village and that's going to drive some business but it's not necessarily going to be it can't be the only source of business or the only kind of business. What business would it drive? If we're going to have a truly diversified tax base, then we need a lot of different kinds of, of businesses coming into the into this area, uh, not just not just ones that you know, not just stores or or shops or. And the other piece of it is there's a lot of, you know, you can go to Portland and you can see places where there's supposed to be retail on the first floor and, and residences on the second floor and that retail space isn't, is, they're having a hard time leasing that out. It's rent. So, you know, I, it's not a panacea to say that you can have commercial on the first floor and residences above it and that that's necessarily going to work. I, I think my frustration with this is I feel like we're, being asked to make decisions before I understand the nuances of the impact of what we're doing. Well, I, and that's why my yeah. guard is up. Right okay, now. two two points to that. One, we to my point earlier, you need to have some meat on the bones to have a conversation. So I think the planning department's just looking for us to give them yep. some direction so they can pull some I detail and and yep. and give us more time. Um, I'm I guess I'm I'm leaning towards Krista. I understand what you're saying. We definitely only have so much commercial space and people get really wigged out when commercial shows up in their neighborhood. That's just part of life. Back to life. Um, but I also know that we have like BD2, which is Northbrook, and I know that hasn't really panned out much, but we also put um, the property that abuts Northbrook in our village TIF on, on, per request of, I believe, the person who owned it because they can see some potential when the other um, TIF district expires that there's some connectability there. So I, I understand it all, to me, that's like the industrial parks. That's where the big businesses are going, the manufacturing, but maybe even a hotel would be okay there. Um, but for the commercial, traditional commercial along the road, I kind of agree more with Krista because if you go to a lot of the, you know, build Maine or these other seminars, if you look at the way towns used to be built, that's how it was. Commercial and residents were all mixed together. And then somewhere along the line, we decided mini malls were the way to go. We started moving all our commercial into these giant open, the main mall, the Auburn mall, and you can walk through those and, you know, there's, mm -hmm same vacancies a lot of that retail space I don't see is changing how that has anything to do with this well i think by having just a commercial where you have no resident we're recreating that we're shoving all the commercial over here and all the residents over here and in my mind you know i've read enough books and seen that it just seems more viable to have some sort of combination now do you want a manufacturing firm in the middle of somebody's neighbor neighborhood? Probably not, but then we have other options. We have the business district too, to try to direct them or- That's um, the transition zones were meant yeah, for the trans business. Or where you maybe have something behind on a back lot or something. I mean, so. the, we define what, a, what the village core growth area, types of development we wanna see um, in the comp plan. It says right here, this type of growth, or rather, um, new mixed use and commercial development should be permitted to include restaurants, service businesses, and higher density residential developments um, because the focus should be on accommodating and providing places for a diversity of small local businesses and services. That, that was the intent of the growth area. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. I got it. I just yeah. you're not yeah. going to get my vote. No. Yeah. Well, and that's not fair. not. It's it when you look at the percentage of space that we have zoned commercial now, I don't think it's two percent of town. Right. So I I don't think it's not like we're excluding acres and acres and huge chunks of gray from being developed as residential. And it's such a small space, it's still walkable. It's still fits well, like, the bill. You're just not gonna convince me that it's not worth protecting that 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 mm -hmm. those zones as they're currently outlined. So yeah. we can move on. Okay. Well and, and transition will expand that percent a little bit. It isn't gonna you know vastly improve it Dan, but it's gonna allow a little bit more mix too. So we are making a little effort there. So the overlay is a yes, and good luck to you with the lines. Okay. <laughs> one, coming back here. Yeah, you'll come yeah. back here and... Yeah. <laughs> 1.4% one, one of gray is currently zoned okay, commercial. See, there you go. Yeah. So, so What's sorry. that percentage? 1.4. So I'm, I'm, I'm not buying the idea that somehow we're making it hard for people to build residential yep. developments of any kind. Right, but I'd also commercial space I'd yeah. point out that we have commercial outside those zones too. So yeah. we have so industrial. You know, yeah, and we have you know like this couple of solar arrays that came along. We're not in the commercial zone, so. Okay, so maybe up to three or four. Well, I'm just pointing out it's it's yeah. we're I think we're working on it. You know, we're trying to work on it a little bit. It's not moving obviously at the pace you want it to, but I nope. think there's some improvement there. Okay, uh, density. And it looks like you have a couple questions under that one. Yes, yep, uh, very bottom of the uh, council pack, page 11. And again, this is, the, this is the summary, and for anyone watching the meeting, uh, the background is included on the earlier pages of this council pack. That this was just an attempt to bring it together and hopefully get as much uh, policy guidance as we can, um, borrowing your analogy, to put some meat on the bones and bring it back. So basically, um, <clears throat> the density um, requirements, and that's, um, and I really appreciate having the table that made it very easy. So yeah. thank uh, our thanks attorneys for digging through that, and Kristen. Um, so that's on um, packet page uh, 13 and 14. Um, but there are <clears throat> allowed a density, which has been part of LD2003, and then your question is, do we, we have the ability to allow even more density? Um, and sure. the question is from the counselors whether we want to or not. And the have three questions you have are? There's minimum requirement that we have to allow. Do you wish to exceed that? Okay, so the first one is, do we want to allow more than two dwelling units on a vacant lot outside of the growth area? No. Dan? I'm a no. Yeah. No. I'm also a no. Do we want to allow more than four dwelling units on a vacant lot within the growth area? No. 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 And I'm also a no. And There's then, consensus on this. Okay. Yes. Do we want more than two additional dwelling units on a lot that has one existing dwelling unit? One of those must be within or attached to an existing structure. No. You're no. a no, and I'm a no. And Dan, are you writing that down? Yeah, I am. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, I, I think everybody's probably in the same boat. Um, we, we're not sure exactly what's going to happen with this new density, and so okay. start with the minimum and work our way around it. If, if we want more later, we can always change it. Okay, so number three. T two, I think. Oh, two, I'm sorry. Yep. Does the council wish to allow additional density or explicitly prohibit additional density in the instance of a teardown and a rebuild? So we can require the structure to be rebuilt with the same number of dwelling units or allow the structure to be rebuilt subject to the current density standards. And my first question is, can we do this by zone? So could we have one decision for the growth? overlay and another decision for the rest of town or is it one size fits all that was I my question i believe it can be distinguished between the two i'd have to verify that okay so let's, let's, let's say it can be for okay. argument's sake for, 
purpose? Um, I'm, I'm sort of of the opinion um, of where we landed with the ADUs and existing structures. I, I, I don't think someone should be penalized because they have a building on their property already. If this is the rule that we allow these numbers of units, um, depending on whether they're in the growth area or not, I think that they should be um, allowable whether or not the building is torn down or not. I think it should just be one rule for all properties. Dan? Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's too complicated to get yeah. into splitting those hairs. Okay. Marty? I agree with Dan. Okay. And I would have preferred to just be in the growth area, but I'm outnumbered. So that's a yes. Nate? What if the structure that burned down theoretically has more than four units? Would and you allow it to be rebuilt to the number of units that were there? It, uh, it, Right now they can do that, but it's whether or not if it With, were. Within a year it would be um, a, let's put the non-conforming user, non <laughs> it would be, if it was legitimate, if it was locked in, mm -hmm. if they if they obtained permits. It was permits. correctly permitted. Exactly. <clears throat> yep. Okay. Sometimes units get added without permits, in which case you're locked in for what you got permits for. So that wouldn't change. The difference is that if someone had a, one unit and they it burnt down they could put the two units or the four units depending four. on where they yep. were in town yep okay um a similar question came up with the self-storage units um mm -hmm. and i think we landed on retaining the new the same design standards that were currently on the books for new for the new bill didn't didn't we yeah it has if um, for replacements. For replacements. Yes. Yeah. But not the rest of their facility. So, like, if they lost one of three buildings. It was contingent upon when the buildings were initially built and if they were there as of the adoption of the standards. Okay. So we would we let them retain their non-conforming use if it if it was. I'm just conf I'm guess I'm confused. I just want to be consistent on how we approach this sort of scenario I, I'm just they'd be allowed to retain what they have it would actually it's never seen it pushed this way but it would actually be a non-conforming structure of record because it might not meet the design standards okay I know but the design standards are different than the, the building like the building of the unit but I, I just want to the way we kind of think of it I want it to be consistent um, yeah I guess I'd be okay with them rebuilding um, whatever they have currently Dan yeah, that seems fair to me. I have a, we don't have design standards everywhere though, so there's instances where that wouldn't apply. If they were replacing a structure, they could build it any old way they want. Well, and to your point earlier, once we revisit the village design standards, we were gonna kind of catapult those to other districts. I mean, yeah. we started in the village and then we were gonna look at it to say, should all duplexes have design standards or should all, no matter where they are. Right. So that might be something you guys want to consider. I mean, I recognize we're not we're not talking about design standards in that scenario that no, Nate no. just proposed. But I just, I'm just thinking about it in the same way. Yeah. Like, you know, do we let people just rebuild the way it was, or do we? Well, it's important forward. that you yeah. do bring that up because we do want yeah. to have consist consistency mm -hmm. in our ordinances. So, yeah. so I think your answer to two is yes. They two. are allowed. Um, we're going to allow the additional density. The for tear downs board. and rebuilds regardless of where they're located. And then to Nate's question, if they already had more than four. Yeah, if they were permitted. If they were, as yeah. you said, the yeah. current restrictions. The yeah. existing yeah. permitted number. Of yeah. Mm -hmm. If they exceed, then they can, and they were legitimate, they can rebuild as they were. Right. Yep. Okay. Right. Yep. Uh, number three, for affordable housing projects, does the council wish to allow density of more than the minimum of two and a half times the base density of the zoning district in which the housing is located? And if so, to what extent? I had, I needed questions answered in order to answer this <laughs> Go question. Go right ahead. So I, I guess I, I don't know what the base is for um, the districts we're looking in, That's right, I guess is. So uh, village centers, 20,000, lot size, 10,000 per dwelling unit, uh, VC and VCP. Uh, commercial is 
forty thousand and the lots uh, I'm trying to remember the minimum area per dwelling unit with public water and commercial it's either 20 or 40. It's, it's similar it's conceptually similar in medium density the, the minimum area per dwelling unit is cut in half for most districts for a lot that is served by public water. So what does that equate to for units? I guess is that's ultimately where it like, depends on your lot size. I'm not okay. trying to be argumentative. See, no, well, no, I think I, if you I'm use not. like the investor housing <laughs> yeah. example, that might help her. What was the density bonus that they ended up it when we made that change? It was, but we restricted it. Was it 14 acres? It was 14, 13 yeah, acres. 14 they had to have yeah. for multifamily. Yes. Yeah. I'm assuming all affordable housing projects will be multifamily. And maybe that's the wrong assumption. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're weighing in no. on what she's talking about, not you. And <laughs> no, I, I, no. Just, it's just thinking. It's a good question. I don't see it's that probable, it would have to be, I would but say. probably, yeah. Would, yeah. It's the only way you can gain the economies of scale. Right. Yeah, and my, I was kind of thinking the same way because the way that I read your memo and the way it's written, this is already kind of restricted because this only applies in the growth area and there are public water requirements. And there's, there's mention of sewer, but in gray, that would be septic. Yeah. So obviously, it would be much harder and, and be a different um, septic system design for something that's far more dense than what is currently allowed. So by definition, with those restrictions, it already seems like even if you allow the two and a half times. The septic system is yeah, not Yeah, it's going to really restrict it. Mm -hmm. um, and I liked our approach, and I'm not sure we can do it anymore, but with the, making sure that a certain, you know, you need to have a, a certain size lot to start with. Um, for larger projects, but it's like when I was thinking about this, like, uh, oh yeah, we should do that, and then, oh, I don't know, and then the Avesta housing project is an example of the affordable housing projects. I think those who pass this law are really trying to push. They don't want the two-unit or four-unit mm -hmm. affordable because it doesn't really make a dent. They want the larger 25-unit structure, and if you do it right, it's using less space and it's located right, you've got walkability and access to services. So I'm, I'm leaning towards, yeah, I'd be okay with it, but I don't know if I want to go above the minimum yet either. Yeah, so, yeah go, ahead. go ahead. So the statute says that for affordable housing, you have to allow two and a half times. The yeah, question right. is this if is you above. Want yeah. Yep, and then the, the second point, which you haven't really touched upon is that the uh, the state minimum lot size law, it, in the absence of public sewer, um, the state minimum lot size law allows 300 gallons per day on a uh, 20,000 square foot lot. And so throughout, and this is, this is also in the statute, just sort of as a point of information, um, for ADUs, for affordable, for density, if you exceed that wastewater density of 300 gallons per day on 20,000 square feet or whatever the ratio happens to be for the particular lot, then it's going to require a minimum lot size waiver. And so the, the, the statute says on point that you need to adhere to the minimum lot size okay. law. So the point of that is that there is stop gaps. Yeah, there is a stop gap. There will be, okay. uh, you know, putting aside wellhead and so forth. So that is built into the statute. So do you, what I hear you saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you don't have the area to take care of the septic, then you're limited by that and you're not going to be able to build the building. You need but to, I heard you yeah. say the word waiver, so can that be waived? There, there is an ability for a waiver in the minimum lot size law and one of the questions that I'm wrestling with is whether or not there should be a, a, a standard, I don't know if we can do it, added that says minimum lot size waivers are not allowed 
That would be my so choice. I, I don't know, and, and of course this is a new statute, it hasn't been tested, and I don't know, I'm trying to figure yeah. out who to ask, actually. Yeah. I have yeah. the question, but I don't have the answer. Right, and then the other issue I had with it is the only two parking for every three units. And and right now, you know, once once Main Street in Yarmouth is done and we revamp, you know, panel to change the parking here and we we have parking on the village gateway in the village area, that might not be as big of a deal and we're gonna have to have a traffic ordinance, obviously. But that does concern me a little bit that, you know, where are all these cars gonna park if the developer's only required to do two spots for every three units. It has come up in the Avesta conversation at planning board because the number of parking units that they're have in their plan for the new building is considerably less than what the existing structures have. So, and they basically used their analysis of their own properties in basically making the planning board comfortable with the fact that they have fewer slots. Well, it's interesting because if you look at Wyndham, they're putting up a couple of very large buildings and there's yeah. very little parking. There but is. I think the larger the building, and I'll, I'll go back to my daughter's building in, in Texas, which is you know five city blocks and six stories high, whatever it is. And they have a parking garage, but you can drive through that parking garage and there's plenty of parking. And there are not enough spots for everyone, full occupancy, I'm sure of it. But there's enough people who work different times and are off at a doctor's appointment, you know, whatever, visiting friends, or they only have one car or whatever, that it works. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a little puzzled by it myself, Dan, the whole parking. And until we have a better option, it concerns me a little bit. I see in the future there'll be better options. People will be able to park on the street and we'll have a parking ordinance and we'll have a space for them to move their vehicles to, but right now we're not quite there. Um, so do we want to stay with the two and a half times for now or do we want to go higher? Well, I have one other question. How does the, I mean, this is strictly about affordable housing projects. Yep. Mm -hmm. I just want to be clear. Or yeah, affordable, yep. maybe not in yeah, an affordable housing structure. Okay, because an affordable housing structure doesn't have to be like. No, it doesn't have to be 27 no, units. No, it doesn't have to be 27 oh. units or 25 sure. units. So in the scenario where it's not, um, we've set a maximum square footage for ADUs. Yes. How, how does that figure into this calculation? I think the statute is silent on that. I How would it affect the dense? In other words, does our limitation, maybe this is a better question, does our cap on the size of an ADU run foul of this density calculation? Separate. Oh. Three separate sections mm -hmm. of LDO3. Allowed. ADU, density, yeah. affordability. Yeah. So, so they don't. It, it does, has no bearing. No, okay. The ADU does not overlap into affordable, if that's it's your not, question. Yeah, that's so. Yeah. ADUs are not considered part of affordable housing projects? Not necessary. You could have an affordable ADU, I suppose, but, but they're intended to be separate within the confines of the statute. I understand. I'm just trying to... So you, what you're telling me is no, that the density conversation we're having here isn't in conflict with our cap on the size of an ADU. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Let me see where you might. Thanks. Doug, under 03, as best you can tell, would a, a development the size of the Avesta um, proposed developments still have the same process for permitting that it does now, or would that process have to be changed to meet 03? There's a provision. I think that there's some qualitative language that the permitting has to be uh, something to the effect as streamlined as possible. Okay. I would think that the, as a practical matter, I think the town has some options with that. Um, it, uh, my off the cuff recommendation in response to LDO3, trying to keep in spirit with that, would be to set a series of performance standards that if those are met, 
then the permitting process That's could be easier. streamlined if there were one or more waivers. This is just a concept. Mm -hmm. If there were one or more waivers that were necessary, maybe it would go to planning board, but that would, maybe it could go to staff review committee yeah. as an example. To, to Dan's point earlier about so. staff review, right. And, and can you imagine in the occasion of uh, a project that exceeds the two and a half times density, maybe treating it like a major subdivision or treating it as a CZA? It would trigger subdivision. That's Just, a really good yeah, point. Yeah, to the scale of like a subdivision. Yeah. So pretend, I mean, I'm th I'd have to Higher check. Higher standard of review. I'd have to check with legal on this, but it theoretically, stepping on a limb here, it could go to staff review committee for site plan for that component, and but subdivision has to go to planning board. So, so subdivision mm -hmm. statute's crystal clear about that. So there, there could be like a provision put in place for something that exceeds two and a half to go through a process like that. Yep. possibly. Like a tier, a tiered approach. Would you recommend that approach? Sure, I, I think it's at some thresholds, looking at. Um, Outside of what we're not governed to do by 03, we could set some other thresholds. Which, which understandably begs the question of where the town of Gray is going to land with the multifamily standards. Um, there's multifamily in the village, multifamily outside of the village. To me, yeah, they're, and, and they're, they're kind of separate. <laughs> I mean, contract zoning is available at any time for anyone. If they hit something, they may not meet the standard, but they can certainly come in and talk to you about it and you yep. fill out the process with them and, and decide whether there's a balance to it or not. I mean, the purpose of the contract zoning is if we have the rules set and they want to ex they want a waiver that is, is above and beyond, the, the town has to get something in exchange for it. It has to be beneficial to the town. And that once again, like a seesaw, has to at least be even, but it really should be more of a benefit to the town than what's being asked. And typically, so. most municipalities that have contract zoning uh, eligibility, if you will, on the books, contract zones are not typically uh, approved um, solely for density purposes. Right. There, there needs to be, as you pointed out, there Something, has to be a, some other a balance. If you're yeah. going to the philosophy is if you're going to exceed the parameters of the duly adopted zoning, then there should be a community benefit. Right, right. So back to the two and a half. Do we want to stay at two and a half to start with? Do you want to go higher? Dan's going to answer first. Well, I, I think I'd stay at two and a half just because, like everything else, we have the chance to revisit it. And mm -hmm. it just feels like... I don't know what I would increase it to yeah. at this point in time. Yeah. You know, I don't have enough information to go, well, three would be better. I mean, so I guess my thought is to just stick with the two and a half. I think I we're going to see that a lot of towns are going to just stick with what they're being forced to do and then mm -hmm. kind of just brace for impact, so to speak, well, to until see. Until we figure out what well, the it, actual, like you say, the impact is. Yeah. It's and what's to, to what's change the, the variables. Yeah. What's the need and what are the developers going to like? out of this, you know, they're going to look at this and say, you know what, I'm going to go after this section here because this is going to make more sense for me. I mean, you just yeah. don't know. Krista? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm landing the same place Dan is. Like, I, I think we have too many unanswered scenarios and we should just stick with what's being required right now and then we can always revisit it later if we're finding it's a limiting mm -hmm. factor for people. Stay with the two and a half. Yeah, and for me, I'm the same, and I, I'll add the complexity of the fact that we haven't implemented our comp plan right. yet. Yeah. And that's the other piece that's, if we had had our comp plan fully implemented and we were just dealing with 03. I might feel better. Yeah, about a lot I of think we'd be, well, I think we'd be able to dig in a little more, and yeah. right now we really can't dig in. So um, the I answer to I just feel like we could inadvertently be making implementing the comp plan harder. To, I don't want to inadvertently. Yeah, that's a good point too. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. So that's a no. We're going to stick with the two and a half. Thank you. For now. Uh, affordable housing still on that. Does the council wish to extend the affordability requirement beyond the 30 years required by state law? Um, 
and this is in order for them to qualify, they have to sign a paper saying it's for 30 years. It's actually part of the town review to make sure that the covenants are legitimately binding for a minimum of 30. Do you wish to go beyond, beyond that? that? I think 30 okay. is good. That's fine. Yeah, my, my one hesitation though is I just recall, and if I misquote her, I apologize in advance, but I recall Ann Gass saying something about her disagreeing with, with these 30 year requirements on affordable housing. I don't recall what her reasoning was, but I'm. That she um, didn't think they were long enough? Yeah, I think uh, she wished yeah. they were longer. Permanent. Uh, permanent. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I actually, you know what? I think um, I think she was talking about some, uh, a different approach that they use in Vermont. Okay. Um, where they, it, it's a, it's a build. piece of property that is built as affordable housing. It's forever, and there's what the difference is is there's churn, and they have s sections of it that aren't. People stay there for 20, 30 years, but they're expected when they buy their home to turn it over for the same, to to keep it in affordable status. Uh, it's almost like a community rather than just a, an affordable housing project in a town. Kind of thing. So I think that might have been, but I don't. Yeah, I'd have I don't. To ask I, I would have to ask her too. I yeah. don't recall specifically, but I don't. Know, I, I, she just has a lot of background in that, and so that yeah. gave me pause when reading this because I don't have as much knowledge around um, the affordability um, timeline here. So, yeah. well, I, the other piece to worry about is if we require 50 years in gray and we're trying to attract affordable housing, and other towns are sticking at 30, yeah, and those developers are going to probably go to the. Well, a lot of, I shouldn't say that. A lot of the developers outside of organizations that run affordable housing, they build it and they leave. Somebody else manages it. So I shouldn't say that. That may not be. A, did you have your hand up, Dan? Um, as far as this rule is concerned, when you sell the property 25 years from now, are you selling it for the original price? It's in the rule. Of the keeping a pro having a property affordable for the first owner is easy. The the real loggerhead has been how to keep it affordable. Well, I understand that, but I guess so I'm I think just looking it's for the, there's rent control, so I don't know that it dictates the price of the sale. But when you're buy you're selling it to a prospective buyer, they have to understand their their rent is restricted. So it ha I think it's like 120 percent of the medium. There's a HUD for for yes. for, purch, for purchased properties. Yeah, it's eighty percent for rental units. Yeah. yeah, so I think that that's the, the piece that has to stay on there. It's on uh, the next council packet, page page thirteen, three quarters of the way down. Uh, so there is a restriction. Down, eighty and is what I'm trying to say. Right. I'm just not saying it very well. Yeah, I guess I was just trying to understand. You know, after the thirty years lapse piece, then they're free to do and whatever they, they do want. Because they want. the price of property thirty years from now significantly <laughs> different than the price mm -hmm. of property now. So, mm -hmm. I, yeah. It, so, and you also think about the life. I mean, buildings have a lifetime themselves, and in 30 years, you're going to be looking at probably doing some significant renovations to a building. Oh, yeah. You know, you've got roofs and other things that wear yeah. out. So, I, I think I'm okay with the 30 year. Just say some of the sensitivity around this time, 30 year mark, is because some of the building, some of the housing that was built under this provision 30 years ago is starting to right. come out of it. And it's people are rate. being dis yes, displaced by market rate rents, and there's you know, a lot of upset and turmoil around that. So I think it's a major issue. Once a building comes out of that, um, provision, it can be rented for whatever the, the property owner wants it. They generally don't dispose of it because this is when they're going to start making money on it. It's a long-term investment. And um, notwithstanding certainly the maintenance issues there, it's still profitable for them to keep them. So I, well, right now, rents are, are crazy. I'll just add to that that notwithstanding that sensitivity, the, the market does not favor new construction for this sort of thing right now. So putting another obstacle in the way of it could, to your point, be a de serious deterrent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think, is it 30, 30 for now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 30 okay. for now. And then uh, does the council wish to advise on whether entity would be the, which entity would be the party acceptable to the municipality to enforce the affordability provision? 
And I had a question on this because in one somewhere in your note, and I didn't put the page number, it says that the main Department of Economic and Community Development is going to adopt the rules to enforce the affordable housing requirements. So I'm not sure if that I, I wasn't sure if we could answer this question yet or who, not. Who are they going to make responsible? Yeah. Are they going to end up designating mm -hmm. a certain entity to do that? Yeah. And so on council packet page 16, okay. um, number three is this is the language straight from the statute. My, my reading, my understanding of what they're trying to do here is at the time at which the affordable housing gets approved by the town through whatever process. There's a requirement in the, in the middle here that uh, recorded the registry for the benefit. Um, uh, and it's the third line down, the fourth line down in number three, and enforceable by a party acceptable to the municipality. Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that some state entity, Maine Housing Authority or others, yeah. is going to be yeah. involved with that, yep. and that the town's involvement is limited to the approval process, and making it. sure that it's in place and meets the standards, and then it's very, it's conceptually right in line with a conservation easement for a piece of property where the town, if it was required uh, in subdivision, as an example, which it's not, but. Um, there's a separate entity the, that enforces the restrictive covenant. And I'm hoping for taxpayers of gray sake that municipality is not going to be responsible for enforcing that. Yeah, because to my, my mind, it's the planning department, but then who? And then you're talking about having to have staff time, which is another unfunded mandate. So yeah, I would... And, and how would you even necessarily and how would you even, yeah, the you'd have to literally go find out who was being charged what and make sure that the calculations all match to this. It's, it's complicated. Yeah, because we'd be hiring a person, exactly. It's like planning short can't term rentals. Force, so. Yeah. Right. And so if it, would be, we put, it would be the code if you It would be, I meant, yeah, planning. I meant, probably I put you guys together, planning. The town board. assessor could conduct <laughs> some of that, the, affor the affordability analysis, but it would be a cost to the town. Yeah, so I would say unknown, I guess, right now, unless they yeah, force us to see. identify pending the rules, because, so, yeah. Would the, so I guess the, the policy question, maybe we didn't state it as, so is the council supportive of seeking a separate party, not the town, that would be responsible for ensuring that it stays affordable? Yes. 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 Okay. And hopefully it's a state agency that right. doesn't cost us okay. anything. Because right. that way we're not jammed in the middle of all mm -hmm. kinds of... Well, it's just, there's, like Nate just said, you know, Lauren would do a piece, Code would do a piece, somebody else would, you know, you're the ones getting the covenant, so it's... Well, know, Nate, like, just the tracking all of that. Yeah, okay. crazy. <laughs> all right, we're running up hard on seven here. So mm -hmm. multifamily standards is our next section. So does the council support amending the definition of multifamily development too? And I think the difference here, and I compared it quickly, was the two or more. Go ahead. So, so the concept here, so right now in the zoning ordinance, we have multifamily development. Uh, what we're proposing to do uh, in connection with implementing LDO3 is to have multifamily structure, like one multifamily structure on a lot versus multifamily development, where you would have two or more uh, multifamily structures on the same lot. And to make that distinction and to utilize that distinction for the purposes of implementing the density and the affordability. That's the concept. I so think it makes a lot of sense. I think we actually need to answer question two before we can answer question yeah. one. Yeah. So does the council support adding the state definition of multifamily dwelling in, the in our zoning ordinance? And so multifamily dwelling is defined as a structure containing three or more dwellings. I'm, I'm fine with that distinction. I don't see any value in having it be different. Yeah. So I, I agree with that. Okay. Adopt the state. So then one. Okay. Sorry. 
does the council support amending the definition of multifamily development to and then a lot which contains two or more multifamily dwellings two or more duplexes three or more single family dwellings or any combination of buildings containing three or more dwelling units okay. does this is this our recommendation our language or is this the state's proposed it, language it's a combination okay. um, so if we're doing two do we want to do one yes well, that's, that's what I'm wondering like one is coming from the planning department not from the state Two is from the, the, state. the statute, right? And so this is very similar to like daycare, where we try to bring our definitions in line. Okay. So, we're in the multifamily dwelling versus multifamily development. I'm just struggling a little bit with the distinction. It's more than well, one dwelling. Yeah. So you could have one multifamily dwelling with three or more units, and that be the only development, just one building. A, develop, a development would include more than one building. It just seems um, if our description of a multifamily dwelling is a structure containing three or more dwelling units, then why couldn't we just say the development is more than one structure? It wouldn't work with ADUs, for one it's example. More than one dwelling yeah. unit. If you had a structure. detached ADU. So it's not considered a multifamily unit, but it has but more I, than one dwelling unit. I don't say that. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. I may be being wooden headed. No, no. no if I'm, because of the ADUs, you can now have multiple dwelling units on your property. Um, but it's not, but it's not considered. But it's not considered a multifamily dwelling. It's a single family home with an ADU. Right. The okay. distinction is made at three single dwellings, whereas two would be just right, your house and an ADU in the backyard. It's a little arbitrary. I defer to the group on this one. <laughs> yeah, it's, sorry, yeah I'm, it's confusing. I'm just not. It's very confusing. I mean, my, my concern with the development sentence um, is that we're the only word we're amending, from what I understand, is the word two on the yeah, beginning of the sentence. Yeah, it's from one to two. 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 Yeah. But then if you do the math, so if we're changing the definition of a multifamily dwelling to three or more dwelling units, two multifamily dwelling units would result in six units. Right. Two or more duplexes would have evolved, has resulted in at least four units. Right. Three or more single family dwellings would result, result in at least three. But then it says any combination of buildings containing three or more dwelling units kind of conflicts with our definition of a multifamily dwelling. So I would be in favor of changing the word three in the development in that last part of the sentence to four or four or more, but, and changing the single family. I don't, but then that complicates the single family one. I, yeah, I understand your confusion with the language, Dan. Why? Yeah. <laughs> so, well, we're just trying to categorize. Right. I mean, the well, density yeah. requirements are still the density requirements, but yes. when does something become multifamily? So can we remove duplexes? Can well, seven. it is multifamily if they're connected. Are the connected, duplexes right? not a multifamily? Well, it especially is. even more than one. Right. Here's, an, here's another question. What is the distinction between two single-family units and three single-family units with respect to a multifamily development? Right. Like you could simplify the whole thing by just saying a lot which contains two or more dwellings and just eliminate the rest of it. But there seems to be some distinction between two and three single family units. Am I reading yeah, that right? Yep. No, I think we may need to, to flush this out a little bit. That the intention here was to, as we implement LD03, particularly with the density uh, and the affordability, to introduce terms that are going to work Cross. for a future uses table in the growth area. Right. We're trying to plant the seed, almost literally. Yeah. So why would we treat two single family dwellings separate, differently than three single family dwellings in the zoning? Maybe we don't need to. I think that's, I, that's a, kind that's of what I'm point. wondering. It's yeah. a good point. Yeah, because yeah, if you eliminate the single family designation here, then it, wor it works, it works Or change it to two. 
Just say two it, dwellings. Yeah, right. right. Two or more yeah, dwellings. Two or more dwellings. Multifamily dwellings. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we can. Play yes. I mean, unless that, conflict, unless that conflicts with the ADU, which has two right. dwellings. Uh, and, and that's what we're trying to, right. again, it's looking ahead to the uses table for the future districts. That, that's what we're trying to do. I but suspect good you're gonna, yeah. you guys are going to come up with the definition, and then as you're moving along, you're yeah, going to we'll end up keep looping back. <laughs> I'm serious. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think because the, there's separate categories. So, well, so if Doug finds that there is a need to make that distinction based on lining up with other stuff around the ADUs, are you okay with that, or would you want to revisit? I would say that? have more conversation about it with this feedback, yeah. and then come back with the new, okay. new, and we'll take another stab at it. Because <laughs> you're right, if there is a distinction, then he'll be able to tell us. This, we figure it's going to take a couple oh, this workshops is, to get This is endless this. workshops. Uh, I'm rolling in my head. Five, six, seven workshops. <laughs> okay, well, between this and the comp plan and the zoning, and the, there's a lot of workshops ahead. Okay, third one, does the council support creation of separate performance standards for multifamily dwellings and for multifamily developments? So this, this is a high, so if, if we have the allowance for a multifamily structure on a lot versus multiple multifamily structures. Should there be different performance standards for those two different situations? What do you mean by performance standards? Do you mean design standards or things like buffering and, and mm -hmm. such? Set All of it. All of it. All of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Marty's striking out as an L. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I like it when you jump in. Mm -hmm. I think that you. I think that you have to some extent because the impact of multiple structures on a it's lot different. is going to be different yeah. than a single yeah. structure on a lot that was the reason and, it, yeah. and depending on the lot size and where the lot's positioned and what kind of lot it is it just feels like there's a lot of variables there so yeah i, I would think to start it would be safer to to separate those two well and it could almost encourage that smaller footprint less impervious surfaces yeah. if we did the standards right. Mm -hmm. I think of the Weeks Hill project. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Because Smaller their print whole print. waiver was, we're going to do less buildings, you're going to have more open space. You're and they needed, and that was a problem. Yep. Mm -hmm. And all they needed was another how many feet? It wasn't Foot, Footprint and height, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Very helpful. Because you want to you okay. encourage that, because that would have been a better community and when you look at, when I was talking about us looking at the open space that they did in this, this Pennsylvania, Anne actually dug this up. That's exactly what it was. You could see the option one, two, and three, and the difference was just so clear. Like that is a better subdivision. Yep. You know, it wasn't apartments, but it was a subdivision. Yeah. And it's like, why aren't we doing that? And it, you know, and for those people who are living there, less costly mm -hmm. for them because there's less impervious surface that they have to maintain for the rest of their residency yep. so yeah I agree I think that and if we can try to make it advantageous for them to do it one way versus the other that's more beneficial to the sound the town we should definitely do it mm -hmm. okay. carrot yeah. approach okay. yes. yeah. Yeah. Yes. much like the open space subdivision to some extent the density bonuses density for the multiple multi unit <laughs> dwellings whatever they're called <laughs> Whatever they're gonna say, build what you want. That's what we're gonna call it. Multi, multi things. You know, because there's with all of these structures, there's you know, there's sidewalk issues, yeah. there's stormwater issues, septic. there's septic. You know, stormwater and sidewalks. You know, I want to be getting some money for either extending sidewalks or creating them to begin with for stormwater. You know could have the same issue with one of these facilities with stormwater that you do with Gumby's. Yep, depending on and the size. And so you might want to, you know, enter into some sort of licensing for stormwater mm -hmm. for this. So yeah, I think, they, I think the impact of multiple structures is likely to be exponentially greater than just one structure. That was where we were coming from, yep. exactly. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. All right, and then we have a multi, List little list here. Does the council have any input on the following aspects of multifamily development and multifamily structures? And again, I think this is just throwing things out there to start with. So there's going to be a, there's nobody getting tied in here to any specific. But 
building height? I think this is why the chief was here. I had a quick conversation. Yeah, it's okay. Uh -huh. but there's, in, She's like, I'm out. Sorry, I'm just sorry. Take, sorry. Just going to take Joe. him till seven. I'm out. So where the, I think where the chief is coming from in the building, the IPC, the National Building Code as well, there's a very, there's a lot of variables with um, how close the buildings are, how mm -hmm. tall the buildings are, how many units are in the buildings, yeah. what's the mm -hmm. access to the rear of these multifamily structures, et cetera. Yeah, so I, I, and I read that in there too, the building height and the minimum separation from a public safety standpoint. Yep. So that was kind of my notes here was uh, the Clark Block example was pointed out as that's not a bad thing because, you know, they're, it's almost an attached unit and so it fits in the village. But at the same time, it really depends, is it sprinkled? Does, is there an, an easy access for the firefighters to get into the building? Where would they park the truck if they were fighting the fire? Uh, could they get around to the back of the building? That kind of thing. So, all of that's been a yeah, big, not a big issue, but has been. There's been a fair amount of back and forth with the Vestas plans and, yeah. and these issues. Yeah. So I, I think that whatever is done, there should be. Yeah, we're allowing up to X, but with the condition that they're able to meet certain standards. And that gives the flexibility to say, if you're not sprinkling that building, you can't have that height. You have to, you know what I'm saying? Yep. That's kind of the way I was thinking, I don't know. Same I with the minimum separation. Yeah. I think, and the building codes are relatively mechanical as well as the NFPA codes. I guess what we were trying to drive at here is, does the council have any input on as an example, this is looking ahead to, <clears throat> excuse me, multifamily structure performance standards. Does the council have input on how many stories it should be in the village? Should there be decreased buffers in the village? Should there be uh, build two lines instead of 10 foot setback lines? Um, should there be less buffering in the village? And obviously we can't bring closure to all this, but in order for Kristen and I to put a first draft of different standards for multifamily, any input you had would yeah, be Yeah, what was the Weeks Hill? Was that three floors? Is that what was, broke the bank? It was three floors. It, yeah. Instead of two. Yeah. And, and, you know, you look at the Clark block, and, and that's two. Together, yeah. yeah, I could see going to three. If, mm -hmm. But it would have to meet standards. It would have to have, you know, some standards to it to make sure that it's safe. Okay. Um, but if we're going to meet our density, and we're talking 10 or 15 years down the road here, we're going to need taller buildings. I would agree with three. If the third floor was a sloping roof that went back from the street sign to change the, right. you know, the, the physical feeling of the height of the building. Well, you don't want blocks. Um, um, but I think there, I'd have some other suggestions. Yeah, before some other I, I know that from the residents I've heard from, that they really don't want structures that are too tall in the village. And, yeah. I, and I can see the point of view. Um, I'll just say that um, I was at the GP COG assembly last month. Their, the presentation, the presenter was um, a developer of affordable housing. He was really interesting and he's done a lot of work um, locally. Um, but I, I think one of the points he made was that things like height restrictions are, are problematic when he's looking to build because what they what they want to be able to do is to go in and build what's best for them, which I mean it's not surprisingly <laughs> a developer point of view. Um, so I yeah, I don't I guess I struggle because I do I don't want to create all these restrictions and then have nothing built. So I'm just I'm but I think like the, with that. I think that if you do um, you know two full stories with a sloped roof for a third story, and you get into sort of a, a, a modified like mansard roof, you still have very usable space, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it tilts the top of the building back away yeah. from the sidewalk, which I think feels a little different. Um, that's just my well, and quite thought. frankly, those units would be good for people just starting out, and you know, it's a little more chic. <laughs> well, top and they're not units, necessarily quite frankly. smaller. I mean, no, they, they, they're not. They, they would be probably smaller but they're not I don't feel that way I think the exterior design of the building 
makes you think of it as a shorter building mm -hmm. than if it was a block of square of three floors. Well, and everything's costing more. So the, Douglas, I mean, the Douglas House? Oh, maybe. I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah, similar to that. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, to, to Kristen's point, I think Avesta was the same thing. They came in, they're like, if, if I can do this in one building, we have the money to do it. Right. And, and most affordable housing developers are, are looking to make enough money to do their next well, project. They're, the they're rolling. It's, yeah, it's the economy of buildings. So right. I'm, I'm okay with starting out with a certain, you know, saying let's go. I mean, three stories is like groundbreaking and yeah. gray. It's right. a good start. Yeah. And then, you know, maybe if you have a developer come in and say, you know, if I could do this fourth floor, or if it's a certain location, that's going to inform a lot of the changes down the road. Well, but we don't want to lose those feasible. developers because we have these rules on the books yeah. now. But you, know, yeah. like, you could have, you could have, there could be, you know, a formula such that you might have, you might have to be set back from the street further if you build a four-story right. building than if you build yeah. a three-story building. Or where matters too. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I think that I think there are a lot of options there. I don't know how we give you guidance on all of them, but right. I guess I'm hesitating setting a strict limit everywhere because maybe that's not applicable in a way that's effective for someone who wants to come in here and develop in yeah. different areas of town. You know, this is all the growth area, but there are parts yeah. of the growth area that where potentially right. would be appropriate to have. A larger building or, yeah, I mean, or set back from the road. More I mean, if you're that. in the, especially yeah. if you're right in the village center. Right. I mean, but then well, if you start getting in. different from. Yeah, this. and then if you start getting into one of these older neighborhoods, you know, right. having a four story building show yeah. up when everything else is single family homes is going to be cause a little yeah. angst. It would. <laughs> I mean, they probably would be okay with a two story or something, but four story is going to yeah. change that considerably. Nate? I just wanted to corroborate what Councillor Chapel was saying. The developers want to build four and five story mm -hmm. affordable housing units. And if it was in a location like the Avesta project at the end of Hancock, perhaps that would not be as, it would be more hidden and less right. prominent and maybe you would allow something like that there. Um, I just say something I've said before that in the absence of an economic development official or any other um, calling card for the town your zoning ordinance is your calling card and if the developers look and see that they're restricted from doing projects that cash out for them they they might not come yeah. and well, maybe and that's just, fine but yeah well and just, just to, to that, that point out. i i think you know this the fact that we don't have sewer and public water everywhere again a lot of this is gonna there are things we can you're say gonna, we want to do and then there's yeah, reality yeah. of what without you sewer you're not going to build five four or five story buildings on the main street no, He's not gonna do you're, it. Like. you're not. You're right. But perhaps. But down I think the road, can you do can you do the can you do the not I don't want to say carrot and stick that's wrong but can you get bonuses for for instance is you know if you if you set back from the street a little bit more you can go up a little higher if you yeah. create a public yeah. space that was, like that was that. Doug's idea. Uh, yeah. I, I, sorry. Go ahead. No. No. No, that's that's. We, a good we wanted to avoid that. canyons, and you yes. you thought the setbacks allow more of the light in. So you have the porch on it. This this should be the this should be the first floor here. But um, the concept is so front porches build two lines, front porch, and then the sto the yeah. stories step back yeah. as they go up. Uh -huh. Was the Nate and I have yeah. conceptually really discussed this yeah. as opposed to more of the wall. Yeah. I mean, I, it's an solution. idea, but yeah, I think it's a particular kind of architecture that's not, um, that you're sort of freezing yourself into. I'd like, well, to, I'd like to come up with something more flexible. I think, design. you know, to your point, design standards, like, again, my daughter's giant building looks like it belongs in Tuscany, Italy. The, you know, it's just, it's really a nice looking from yep. the outside. You can't tell how many floors it is. You right. really can't. And then you get in there and you're walking around and every hallway it looks exactly the same. It's like a giant labyrinth and you know there are architectural floors. things that you can do. Yeah. That, that Just that disguise the a building. Feel and appearance yeah. of a larger building. Places yeah. like Saratoga Springs where they have yeah. frontages like that and then a mezzanine level and then a step yeah. back yeah. and another step back and yeah. it gets taller. Yeah. It's really beautiful. But yeah. No, that's one opinion. Yeah. 
That's fair enough. Okay, so fair we'll enough. since I it's the beholder. seven o'clock now, so we'll say start with the three floors and we'll go from there. Minimum separation, and again, I I really think buffering, setbacks, minimum separation all need to be some type of. Has to be flexible. flexible, like a range, um, and either they if they're you know either do the carrots for them to get reductions or the type of lot they have, you know what they're bringing to the. T I don't know how to do it, but I think there should be a list that allows that flexibility, and the more it makes sense, and the more we're getting from it, the less they have to do this stuff. Yeah, I mean, the That's planning board had some suggestions around um, yeah. um, those items. I think they said some setback from the road is preferred um, if it's residential use, and that um, they support buffering to parking, but not necessarily to buildings, and don't want to see pavement to the edge of the road. I mean, yeah, we were talking about no. Yeah, yeah it's the same yeah. with having the parking out front. But I would add to that the parking, the buffering is like the um, standards for stormwater or fuel tanks. And I think of the Cumberland Farms where they were going to have that kind of open pit for their stormwater, and it's like we don't want to see that either. So I think buffering is going to be dependent on the element and and location, and but to 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 make it as flexible as possible so that we're not eliminating projects that make sense. Does that sound right to everybody? Um, um, Dan, you're kind of... You well, I am hesitant because there's a massive... Number, when you start talking about design standards and you start talking about setting, um, you start coming up with formulas for the... Set Either the setback or, or the distance between buildings. I mean, there's just a huge amount of things that you have to think through there. And I, I just don't feel like we're prepared in any way, shape, or form to be doing it. It feels kind of like... Too complicated? Well, it just feels like... Um, it feels like we're creating only a fraction of what we really need in order to do this correctly. I guess that's what I think. It's kind of like the duplex design standards in the in the village, you know, we did, we kind of, same sort of situation, you know, we wanted to get something on the books, we got something on the books, it's, it's better, but it's not what we want. Are we going to get back to that ordinance anytime soon to fix the things well, you that are we don't now, like about Because it? you're going to have to do it for this, but yeah, I see your point. I just, I'm, yeah. I just feel like... There's some yeah, tools out floor error ratios as an example. That's a good tool. You can designate those per per level. Yeah. So hopefully we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Well and to your you know, I think you laid out a good option for the separation between the commercial and the self storage earlier. And so I think once we start getting a few of these and maybe the village design standards weren't 100%, but they moved us forward. And I think after you start seeing some of that, it, yeah, it helps inform the next conversation. They move you forward, but when you create a building that's got a life of 50, yeah. 60, 70 yeah, years, you're you stuck of, with that until you get yeah. to move forward again. Yeah, that's I, a good I don't point. really feel that like that's moving forward. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. You got to get it right. Early yeah, on. you really don't have like yeah. multiple chances at that because you, if that house is going to stay there now for. Yep, sign so. ordinance, you know. Yep. All right, performance Just standard based on density. Do we want performance standards based on density? I think we kind of already answered that a little bit earlier. Yep. Yep. Which one right. Right. Um, the four, third from number the four. Of the fifth yeah. bullet down. Okay. I think we kind of already answered that when we were talking about you know one building versus another building and density, wanting different performance standards. Do we want it? based on that density, but also number of buildings probably, right? So I think that's a, a loop, it's, you know, it's 707, it's getting yep. lukewarm answers now. <laughs> Before it was like <laughs> right into it, yeah. Nope. This yes, is good guidance, no. <laughs> appreciate the input. Yeah, sounds, okay, so I, sounds. I mean, I would suggest, I mean, kind of take a stab at what you think is best here and then yeah. we can have feedback around 
Yeah. I think that yeah. might be easier. Yeah, yeah that might be easier. In village, out of village, I would assume, or? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Well, that's kind of where we are. But, yeah. Well, we're only yeah, talking village, about village the growth proper. area for this anyway, right? Okay, but, but if the growth area, you know, with the, with the areas that we're pulling out, they're in, I think that it strikes me that it's appropriate to have different performance standards for multifamily in the village, what I call the village proper versus the periphery. Okay. Yeah, yeah I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's what yeah, yeah. I think okay. that's probably okay. fair. Yeah. Up um, Lewiston Road, um, up Collie Hill, that's mm -hmm. my thing. Right. And then uh, commercial use for larger number of dwellings, different standards. So I think that we've already kind of talked about that a little bit about the commercial restriction, you know, the restrictions yeah. we want to add to commercial. And then total number of units per structure. Um, and I know that I think the planning board said eight to 10 or something, but a Vester was 27. I'm not so sure. I, wanna, I think that's going to be difficult. I'm not but sure you I want to put a cap in the on village. You see right, exactly. So, yeah, yeah, that one's like what you were saying about stories. It's right. a little wonky like, I to start like, putting uh, limits. Right. Because then you're just going to turn people away if you have these really strict numbers in here. I, I just, you're not going to get the buildings if you. Yeah, if you restrict it to the point where they don't. Well, and we have, have other restrictions, you know, right? Stormwater, public water, yeah, I think sewer, that, water. Yes. Yeah, I don't think we have to restrict it either because I think yeah. that those other issues that you brought up, Sandy, yeah. and mm -hmm. I think some of the previous topics that we talked about will influence mm -hmm. that. Yeah, height and yeah. location. All right, did we hit them all? That's plenty, I think, for you to get started, isn't it? <laughs> Keep us busy. Yeah, for the next year. Through the end of the week, anyway. Through <laughs> the end of the week. Yeah, he'll be looking for something to do. Okay, I think that uh, does it. So we will end our workshop, and Dan will do notes on yeah. the LD2003. And I will be working on uh, transitioning into Teams this week. So. Do you still getting, have access? I'm, they're not going to revoke my revoke my access <laughs> until we get through okay um, that, and also my cleaning out my email. And then um, since I have a Facebook page, I'll be working with Kyle on that, and that can help inform the council rules on what happens with the Facebook page after a councilor oh, right. steps okay. down. So because that is public information. Thank you very much. Very Thank helpful. you very much, Doug. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Good night. Actually, that was. That was very helpful. To yeah. I think we've all been waiting patiently for some idea of what's going to happen. So it's a good starting point. All right. Good night. Good night.